Live from the rolling hills of Northwest Arkansas, this is the Brew House. Hey everyone, what's going on? Welcome back to the Brew House. I am your host, The Beard Bro, and uh, I am excited for today's episode because I am officially relaunching the Brew House here. Uh, if you have been following me already, you know that some of my previous stories have actually been about folks in the beer and whiskey industry. And while I love that, while I love them very, very much, um, and we'll still have some great beer and whiskey content on this podcast, um, I'm actually kind of reinventing the brew house in 2024. And we're going to take it a different direction. We're actually going to talk about uh, something that is really, it's, it's been on my mind a lot lately, and that's been about uh, the topic of firearms, uh, specifically firearm safety, uh, training, instruction, the things that are going on in today's world, um, you know, I just can't ignore it because there's a lot of stuff being told by uh, different groups, different organizations, even our government in some places. The media portrays uh, firearms a certain way. I think there's more to the story than they're being than we're being told as a society. And so I really want to just share those stories here. And so what better way to do that than to be able to share the stories from the firearms instructors themselves, uh, folks that are manufacturers, people that are involved when uh, within the firearms industry every single day. And so uh, I'm actually going to be relaunching here i hope you enjoy the new content if you are interested in becoming a guest on the podcast be sure and reach out to me there's a uh, contact in the show notes here but uh, first i want to give a big shout out to the uscca today Um, if you are listening and you've ever had to use your firearm to defend yourself uh, or your loved ones you know the process after that can be really really sticky Um, the united states concealed carry association is actually uh, they're not sponsoring the show, but man, I gotta get, I gotta give them a big shout out because, um, they are doing some really cool stuff over there. Uh, for just 29 bucks a month, you can actually get a membership with them that gives you access to their nationwide 24 seven critical response team. Uh, you also get a, at a insurance policy up to $2 million in self-defense liability insurance. Uh, they also get uh, access to the USCCA's online protector Academy. That's some virtual training that they have some video series and everything. And you get a ton of other great perks and benefits. So check out the link in the show notes below here to learn more about how you can join the fastest growing community of responsible gun owners in America, the United States Concealed Carry Association. So that's out of the way. I want to get into today's conversation because I'm really, really excited. My guest today is a firearms instructor here in Northwest Arkansas. She's actually my personal firearms instructor here in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, she has been teaching for more than five years, but shooting for the majority of her life. Um, she actually just, we figured this out before the show that she has actually spent more than 700 hours of class time uh, logged with other instructors, organizations, different things like that to learn different topics, learn different tactics and techniques. Um, she also does private lessons here. She does concealed carry renewals pistol optics, and she loves working with folks involved in church security, specifically those carrying a firearm uh, involved in church security, like myself. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Miss Kara Connery. How are you? I'm glad to be here. I'm oh, good. 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 Thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate you. Not a problem. Yeah. So, and like right now, we're recording uh, in January of 24, and it's it's snowy and icy outside. 11 degrees. 11. 11. And that's not the wind chill. That is not the wind chill. Um, I feel like, I feel like I'm at where I grew up. Yeah. yeah. Where'd you grow up at? I grew up in Wisconsin. Ooh, what part of Wisconsin? Far Southern. So okay, right, right on the Wisconsin, Illinois border yeah. and uh, grew up milking cows. Okay. Black and white cows in the calendar. They never looked yet that, that pristine, but yeah, that's what I did until I went off to college. Okay. So. You grew up there and how'd you end up in Northwest Arkansas? Um, Walmart. Okay, <laughs> I think right. that's that's the majority of people's answer around here. Yeah, either and, either directly related to Walmart or uh, suppliers. But I uh, worked at the store in where I went to school in Wisconsin okay. for two and a half years, and my husband worked for Walmart as well at that store. And they wanted more IT people, so we moved down here. It was not supposed to be a full time job. <laughs> and, yeah, and I uh, twenty two and a half years in. It was a full-time job. So, um, you know, I intended on being a school teacher. So I went to school to be a school teacher. Yep. Okay. And uh, when it come time to move down here, too late to find a job, uh, school teaching. So I was like, I'll just work at Walmart during the summer. Yeah. 
and I'll start substituting in the fall. Now, mind you, that was fall of 1998. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, never left Walmart. Yeah. So, you they, know, they kind of bring you in. They have that they, culture, they right? They suck you in. And honestly, <laughs> you know, I enjoyed it. I mean, I truly did enjoy it. I yeah. not, not that I enjoyed the corporate culture, but I enjoyed the people. Yeah. Um, and it challenged my brain. I really love that. I, I love being challenged and learning new things. And, and so that just fed that. But, you know, at some time, at some point you, you go, you know what? I just physically can't take 60, 55, 60 hour weeks. And, yeah. Uh, so in 2017, I left Walmart and jumped into real estate. So okay, uh, okay, you know, do real estate kind of part time and and uh, do the gun stuff part time. Yeah. So 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 why real estate? Um, I've always helped people. Just it's it's been drawn to me to help people with houses. I I mean, I used to sit and just look at house stuff. Yeah. And it's funny because I had a couple of friends who were like, "Hey, we're looking for a house. Can you can you just come with us and help?" So yeah. like they had an agent, but I still went with them to be like, I, I tell people being a real estate agent is you are being a, a, a the 90% of the job is psychologist. Yeah. Is yeah. you really, people tell you what they want, but then you work with them and you, you, you process with them and help them to realize that what they think they want and what they truly want are two different things. Yeah. So uh, it's an interesting uh, thing, but yeah. You know, I just enjoyed going through it. And honestly, my favorite part of real estate was working with buyers. And I know the, you know, that's, that's the hardest part of real estate, in my opinion, too. But that's the part I enjoy most. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, that kind of led me into the gun stuff a little bit. Yeah. I, I, because I, I decided to be a real estate agent, that's, that is actually, most people don't know that is one of the top 10 unsafe professions yeah. nationally. And so I knew that I wanted to come home to my husband every night, which yep. means the I needed the great equalizer on my person yeah. uh, showing houses. So, you know, I'm licensed in two states and, you know, there's there's, you know, good and bad areas everywhere. And yeah. we just don't know what we're dealing with when we get in there. And so that's really kind of what precipitated me learning to put a gun on my body and, okay. and going through that. We call it the journey. It, yeah. Is you're really on a journey of you don't decide overnight that I'm going to take this loaded firearm and strap it to my body and it's all just kosher. You yeah. know, um, I laid a, made a lot of mistakes in my journey, made a lot of poor choices. And, you know, me teaching now, I really try to encourage people. I try to help them on their journey. It's still going to take a while, mm -hmm. but the fact is I'm hoping that they don't have to take the detours that I took to get to the final position. Yeah. Um, Cause I took some pretty, pretty poor detours. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, really kind of what started uh, me carrying a gun. And then the, the teaching part of it, I, I decided I, I was with a, um, a women's group. We have we have a, a women's group, a nationwide women's group that meets once a month. Okay. Um, it's called the Armed Women of America. And uh I I wanted to help out more there. And so I knew I needed to get more education. So I decided to sign up for their it was a combo NRA NRA instructor course as well as their certification course. Um and so I did that in 2018. Uh yeah. once you know I'd left Walmart and had more time. And quite honestly, I really didn't think I was going to teach. I, I just wanted to help out with them. And uh, I, I had my mentor and dear friend, uh, you know, kind of nudged me a little bit and encouraged me uh, that we needed, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have more female instructors out there. And so I just took the plunge and, and did it. And so I... Uh, yeah, I've been teaching since late 2018 now, um, and and uh, COVID really changed a lot of things yeah. within the the firearm industry. I mean, you know, we've we've seen tides change with more women uh, wanting wanting to learn uh, how to handle a firearm, wanting to carry a firearm. But I think people started to realize when when we were so locked down with COVID that. They they felt less protected yes. by and don't get me wrong I love our law enforcement officers but they literally cannot be everywhere all the time and so I think that really exposed people and it made them feel 
like they, they had to take more responsibility in their self-protection. And so yeah. um, it just ideally, you know, 2020 happened. And with me being a real estate agent, I, I was able to teach. I mean, I, I, there was some days I taught five days a week, which is wow. really unheard of. You know, there are very, very few firearms instructors that make it a full-time job. Yeah. Um, and so, and even at that pace, it still wasn't a full-time job. Um, so, but anyway, that's, that's kind of my background and kind of how I got into firearms, but man, I've, I've handled a, a, a rifle since I was, you know, I had my first, you know, Daisy BB gun at yeah. probably six or seven. I okay. can't even remember. I still have it. Okay. I still have it. It is sitting in the gun safe. That's so. awesome. We actually just, my son's 12 and okay. we just got him his first Daisy. Now he's shot other firearms before, mm -hmm. but we just, he wanted his own gun. And I said, okay, well, you know, so he was asking for it. We watched, of course, the, the Christmas story, you know, sure. and he's like, kind of giving me the side eye the entire movie. And he's like, well, it sure would be nice if I had one of those. And I'm like, okay, I get it. So we got it for him for Christmas and he hasn't shot his eye out yet. So that's good. I think honestly, exposure um, and, and, and exposure at a young age when they are ready for it. I, yes. I would never force anybody, but man, I was right where your son was. Yeah. I mean, I wanted, I saw my, my uh, older stepbrother had his own BB gun. And I'm like, man, I want, I want to do this. And yeah. so I had that passion from real young. That was a connection I had with my father is um, my older sister, my younger brother. I was the one that always wanted to go out and shoot the gun. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, so no, I, I, I did rifles, uh, but really didn't expose myself to a pistol until 2012. That's actually when I got my concealed carry license, went out and bought our first pistol um, in 2012. So I, I really don't think I shot a pistol prior to 2012. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It so was, that's it was actually all rifles. So. Relatively new to you, then. It is. It's. I mean, we're talking. We're we're barely twelve years into this journey. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, that's I, now. I, I love pistols. I, yeah. They're my jam. That I I just love them. I was gonna so. say you're really good at them too, because uh, I love them. You've been helping me a lot. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm actually on my own journey to getting improving my pistol skills. Uh, my my draw from conceal all this stuff, uh, because I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm confident, I'm capable, but uh, I also know I can improve, right? We can always improve. And so uh, I was I was kind of trying to figure out how to get better. And uh, so Kara and I were actually chatting a little bit. Uh, and she's like, well, hey, I can help you out with that. You know that, right? That's, that's literally what I do. Um, and so yeah, so I, I started working with you here. And I'm, I'm currently at like a one point what four five one point yeah. six you're you're right right on the cusp of what we deem as a professional concealed carrier which is a 1.5 draw to first shot all right um but that hasn't come easy now has it no it has not it is it is definitely not and and trying to figure out um not only you know, you're right i think to go back to a point you made uh when you were first uh starting to chat here if you are looking to get into concealed carrying, it's weird. I'm just going to be honest. It's weird for the first while while you're doing it because you're not used to having uh, something capable of, of shutting down a human being mm -hmm. strapped to your body the entire time. And so it is, it's one of those weird feelings, right? And so I remember going back and kind of through my own mental inventory here of when I first started carrying um, you know, it can seem like it's really overwhelming, but I think the more that you do it, the more that you, uh, you know, I'm sure you probably have some tactics and everything to, to help folks kind of get comfortable with that. I saw a, a video the other day where this guy was saying, Hey, if you just want to start being okay, having a fire, having a firearm on your person, just start, leave it unloaded mm -hmm. and put it on you walking around your house. Yes. Don't ever carry it outside in public. Just I absolutely walk around your house. That and do this so so have it empty but have it so that the the slide's been racked mm -hmm. so that you know that trigger is is in a position that you would know if the trigger was pressed or not yeah and walk around all day with it or or do things i mean clean your house with it on yeah. just understand that 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 it takes time to get used to it. it's no different then the first time you ever wore a ball cap or yeah. you wore a watch or you wear glasses, it's going to feel weird. Yep. It's going to consume you because it just feels so different. Um, but then at the end of the day, check it. Yeah. Did the trigger go off? Yeah. 
Now, if you have the, the important thing is you have to have good quality equipment. That is not just for safety reasons. And, and number one, you have to have equipment that's safe. You need to have equipment that is going to hold the gun. It's got to be retentive. Um, you've got to be able to bend down and and that, mm-hmm. that gun doesn't fall out. Or you um, don't put pressure on a part of that exactly gun that it that, doesn't need to. That doesn't need to. It, it needs to be, you know, comfortable because yeah. if it's not comfortable, you're not going to wear it. Yeah. And, and honestly, it, your equipment ties into how fast can you be? Yep. It, it, it does make a difference. So I always teach my students, it's, a holster has to have those four qualities. Otherwise, you're probably not going to be successful with that holster. Yeah. Um, and the biggest thing is, is, is it got to be safe. Yeah. I love my Amazon, but don't go buy a holster at Amazon. Yeah. Don't, don't. Uh, I learned that lesson once. Yes. <laughs> we, we had that conversation. Um. <laughs> Also, you know, there are a lot of, uh, I would say they're okay holsters, but I would tell you really go do some research and, yeah. and, and be willing to put down 80 to hundred bucks for a good holster. Yeah. Uh, and really yeah. there you're, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, overall, I mean, I, th- there's, there's still 10 companies out there. I could probably recommend that, that would give you a decent holster at that price. And, and again, that money also goes into comfort. They've thought about these. They've done research. It's not a mass marketed thing. You're going to find most of them are fairly small companies yeah. who, who, who do that, those things. And people that I've personally met in the gun world. And so I, I've got the respect, but I also understand how they run their business. And I understand their passion behind it to make sure that their holster meets those four qualities. Yeah. And I think when you're looking out there, the, one of the biggest terms that I've seen thrown around, and it, this goes right to it, the term universal, right? Oh, universal exactly. holsters. I got to be honest, guys, that was my mistake. And and that's that's what uh, I went for a universal hip holster at first. And there's something to, you know, exactly what you're saying. There's something to having that firearm, that, that, that holster um, married to it, you Hold know, it. and it, it has is, to have exactly. some retention to it because it knows it, all its nooks and crannies. Yeah, so. yeah. And I, I, I learned that lesson very quickly. That you, the word universal is great in a lot of areas, holsters and anything firearm uh, related, not so much. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's if I could implore people. Yeah. Please stay away from a holster that says it fits more than one model of gun. Yeah. Just, yeah. just stop right there. Yep, because it, it it won't provide the same quality of carry. It won't provide the same level of of uh, comfort, um, and and that safety, all that stuff. Good yeah. grief! I had a I had a holster one time. Let's go back into a a, a stupid story of Brian here. Um, I had a holster one time that something happened, and I think the 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 clasp on my buckle on my belt came like just broke Mm -hmm. and suddenly this thing falls off the side and the pistol fell over onto its side and thank god it didn't go off or anything like that but the it actually the way it hit the floor the hammer went back oh a holster with retention is not going to have that happen it's not you know something that's that's passive you can do passive retention right it doesn't even have to be an active retention device where it's like hey locked in there like you see a police officer having that over the back end of of their and that's an important thing if you're if you're carrying openly exactly which i would also have that discussion of why you feel you need to carry openly yeah um there's a reason why police officers do it but then there's also a reason why they have at not only mainly one but sometimes two methods of active retention on that yeah um you know i want the i want that element of surprise if somebody has made a poor choice that they want to do something bad to me or loved one that day yep i want that element of surprise yep um and because also you know that if that that gun's visible then you become one of the first targets mm-hmm. for that person because most bad guys don't want to go home with more holes than they showed up with. Yeah. They just don't. They, they want to go in do their act and get out. And get out. And, uh, Absolutely. And, yeah. Go back to their cave, you know, but all right, let's talk just a little bit about there's, there's a ton. I think you mentioned a while ago, um, you know, COVID really activated a lot of stuff for people. Right. And right. so I actually, it was funny when you were saying that I have a good friend of mine, that he uh, he actually was not a gun guy. He did not actually. I'm not going to speak for him, but to my knowledge of of how he believed at that moment, he was not 
he was not really a fan of guns. Mm-hmm. And uh, suddenly COVID hits, the world shuts down. And, you know, same thing. Massive, massive fan of our law enforcement officers, um, our, our men and women serving out there, uh, our military, everybody else like that. But you can't 100% count on them to be there within... 12 seconds, right? Um, the, the moment that you hear someone breaking into your front of your house. Um, it's too late at that point. Yeah, you Nine, better be 911 ready. is not, not going to save you at that point. Yeah. It's too late. I've trained with some, some uh, quite a few national instructors, and, yeah. and one of them is Tom Givens. And right. Tom runs, a, he, he teaches with Range Master. And, and, and honestly, you know, it's a little disturbing to sit in class and have him play this I think it's like 57 second mm-hmm. phone call yeah. uh, to 911 where, where this woman did everything right. Like, you know, door was locked, everything called 911 took, you know, hunkered down with, with a, a child and yet it wasn't enough. Yeah. And, and he plays that in every class mm. and, and his biggest thing is, is, is you know, what's going to, what's going to save you from that. Yeah, we can only outsource the violence. I, you know, if we're going to call nine one one, we are outsourcing violence because yeah. the only thing we can do to stop bad violence is good violence, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so, and for know. those of you listening, and and maybe you're familiar with guns, and and maybe you're not, but uh, I, that that's a strong stance that I definitely want to take is that there is a good difference between bad violence and good violence. There right? is. There's a book called When Violence is the Answer. It's, I think, Tim Larkin. Yeah. A uh, very good read to, to understand that the only way that we can have the will to live in, in a violent situation yep. is if we are willing to inflict enough violence against the bad violence that we overcome that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so a firearm is a, is a tool that as long as you are being threatened with something of deadly force, Yep. You can't you can't use it in all situations, but if you're being threatened with deadly force, that is a great tool that that we can counter with with that violence, so that that situation can stop. Yeah, and and that's it's hard for people to understand. Is so much of of what I want to get across to my students, especially in concealed carry, is the mindset and the decision making. Okay. Using the gun is a small portion of, of that is, is what we're talking about is what comes leading up to that event and making good decision-making yeah. and be willing to flip that trigger to go. I know it's time. I have to, I have to go to battle for myself or I have to yeah. go to battle for my loved one or your child. Um, you know, is at, at what point is it worth fighting for? Even if we yeah. legally can, there's still a decision to say, well, we can, but should we, mm-hmm. or is it truly a must we situation? And I, I can't tell you who to accredit that to, but I think that's something that's a, a mindset thing we have to think about just because the law allows us and still may not be a good idea. Yeah. Um, or is it to the point where we have to choose violence to stop that violence? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that's where, you know, to go back to my reference of my friend earlier, he, he did realize that there has to be something else then I have got to be willing to, to protect my own self and my, and, and his daughter. Right. So he's got a little daughter that um, suddenly, and I think a lot of people probably came to that re that realization and that reaction during that time of going, Hey, Oh wow. I am the very first line of defense between me and this bad person that, that seeks to do harm. So, um, you know, I think going back to that, you know, you mentioned uh, real estate, being a very uh, risky uh, mm-hmm. industry to be in. Sure. Obviously, you're going out to different homes, different places. Uh, you're meeting up with people that you Strangers. don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've, I've seen the, the crime stories, right? We've seen the true mm-hmm. crime TV shows and things like that. And, the, uh, and, and, and they were never heard from again, right? And that you don't have to become a statistic in that situation. And so I, I applaud you and I applaud anybody who is in our real estate community that, that does choose to carry because, yeah, there's, there's a lot of scary situations out there and there are some uh, very interesting characters, we'll say. Absolutely. So, well, let's go into, um, you know, we're talking about uh, the things that COVID kind of brought on and, and just kind of that realization for people. But I noticed like there's a lot of other stuff happening in the world right now of firearms. Um, I mean, obviously, we're we're looking at some different. Uh, there's uh, there's always going to be talk about banning certain things oh, sure. or limiting certain things, right. whatever. But um, one of the things that's actually really cool um, that I think personally is really cool here happening here in Arkansas is 
uh, there's for for years now. There's actually been a, a regular what basic uh, concealed carry mm-hmm. and an enhanced concealed carry. Now, obviously, I know you're not involved in the legislation or anything for right. this, so um, this is strictly opinions at this point. But I saw the other day that they're looking. Uh, did I did I read correctly? They're looking at doing away with the basic and only leaving the enhanced, right? So what they're doing is they're reassessing our our concealed carry law, especially since we did truly become constitutional carry starting the 1st of August. Um, I know the Game and Fish Commission are involved, the state police are involved, and they're having some public hearings and talking through that. And that's kind of one of the things that that's been released is they're 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 considering of of saying, hey, why do we have these two levels of concealed carry now when when the basic, you know, does that really gain somebody uh, is there benefit to having a basic when we're a constitutional carry state? And I would still say there are benefits. Yeah. Um, because, you know, first of all, you can, you can claim constitutional carry, but that doesn't co- go with you across state lines. Exactly. Um, that's where a concealed carry permit in Arkansas specifically states in their law that they provide that concealed carry permit for reciprocity. Mm-hmm. But we also have, you know, the Gun Free Zone Act from 1990, I think it was, that says, hey, you're not allowed to have a gun within a thousand feet of a school. Mm-hmm. So if and there are some, some exceptions. There are some to exceptions the there. And, and so the, one of the exceptions of that federal law that says, uh, it says, unless your state has, you know, given some, some method yeah. to do otherwise. Well, in our state law, I, basically, if you have a concealed carry permit, that be basic or enhanced, that it does allot you to have that gun with you, you know, into the parking lot of the school. Mm-hmm. And now it's got to stay in the parking lot. It, it it can't go with you into the school on developed property of any public or private. Can't school. leave your vehicle. Can't leave your vehicle. It has to stay in there. Um, but the fact is, is, is I feel like that is one benefit. That's a tangible benefit to tell people, hey, why do you need a concealed carry permit? Yeah. Um, also, if you claim constitutional carry now, have you truly sat down? And truly read through the, the laws of where you can or cannot have the gun. We also have where um, you you also do you do you really sit down and understand the decision making process? Yeah. Um, so I think there's still benefits, and and I I don't want to force people to have a, a, a concealed carry permit. Yeah. I I really believe we should have that right to 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 have that that gun with us. But I think there's a lot of benefits, uh, both tangible and and but a lot more is in the mindset of understanding and hearing what are what do the laws say, but also that can I, should I, must I? Yeah. And then at what point should I? Now, when we talk about the enhance, what does the enhance get us over constitutional carry? The enhance is going to allow you to carry a gun on a campus of a higher education school that gets tax dollars from the state. Yeah. So your Arkansas state schools your University of Arkansas schools, and then any any school that gets funding directly from the state. So like in our local area, our community college, they are a state-funded community college. So um, that's where I think you start seeing some benefits. You can can carry in the public area of the airport because that is managed by the state. It, It allows you to carry in the state capitol building. It allows, opens up a lot of state facilities that you can carry in. Um, allows you to carry in a bar. Now we talk about in class, hey, yeah. what's the consequences around that yeah. of of you know mixing alcohol and carrying a gun? So I think there's some benefits to it. And I think why they're doing that is, and, and I've seen this in my students, is they see less value in the basic now and more value in the enhanced because the constitutional carry does not give you access to those additional places. Yeah. So my classes have vastly changed since August to be more people than not. And, and it was funny because I probably had less than 10% of the people that I've ever taught concealed carry come and get an enhanced license to now it's probably 75, 80, maybe even 90% are wanting to do the full money. Just all at do once. the whole thing. Just do yeah. the whole thing. And so that is, that is pretty much now what I'm offering. And I'm offering more enhanced classes because I'm getting more requests for them. Yeah. And I still have, you know, a few people who, who are and generally they're, they're newer people to the gun world and they go, you know what, let me, let me take let me a little bite here. of it and let me start with the basic. Yeah. And, and I've seen them come back as well for the enhanced. So where the state legislature goes with it, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's, it's not a bad idea to reassess the laws overall. 
Um, and, and I would encourage people again, you know, you can absolutely exercise your two way rights to carry a gun in this state, but there are still places that's going to be illegal to carry. Yep. But I would also challenge you, um, make sure you know the law, make sure yeah. you know when you can or cannot use that gun. Um, because constitutional carry is not going to cover you if you've made a bad choice. Yeah. Well, and, and to go back to your point too, just because you can, doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you, you should. should, because there are several people who I trust that can shoot very well. Mm hmm. But I don't necessarily want to watch that person walk around town with one strap to their hip, right? Uh, because uh, again, it, I think it can put off. Not only does it make you a target should someone be seeking to do harm, um, but also I, I think it kind of gives this perception of the kind of the cowboy feel, like you think you're rough and tough. Um, and I think that it can put people at, at that point. It ceases to be about the carrier. And more about the feelings you're putting into other people's minds and kind of the, the unrest. Now, granted, I don't think we need to tiptoe around other people's feelings, right? But we do need to be aware that in some situations, you have people who maybe they've had a bad experience with a firearm. Absolutely. Maybe they have been in a hostage situation. Maybe they've been in a situation where, uh, you know, they lost a loved one due to that. And so... I think if anything, if you decide to exercise, if you're in a state that you decide that has constitutional carry and you do decide to open carry, um, I would just encourage you, one, have a carrying device, a holster that has active retention to it. Absolutely. Um, and two, just really be aware of, of kind of what you could be instilling in people's minds, I guess. Yeah. Let's face it. Yeah. There are many people here who don't even aren't even afforded the choice to own a firearm yeah. in their country. Yep. And, and I have seen them. I've, I've had, I, I can count now. I've had two people now I've taught with green cards yeah. to get their concealed carry card. Because once you have a green card and you're, you're authorized, you can actually buy a gun and carry a gun. Okay. And, and they're working towards getting uh, their, uh, immigration status upgraded so they could become a citizen because yeah. they felt that passionate about having that right. And if somebody's walking around with a, an open carry gun, a, again, like I said, that the feelings is, is a lot of times it's, you know, and I can't speak for everybody, yeah. but many people who carry a gun openly are making it as a political statement. Yes. We can do that in such better ways where we don't make other people uncomfortable. And, and if you're going to carry that gun, it, it should be carried for the right reasons. Yeah. So let's, let's, you know, step back and go, what, why am I doing that? What is my mission? I, I talk about mission a lot because um, our mission is not to be law enforcement. Your and I's mission is not to be military. And so sometimes, you know, I, I see what some people are doing with tactics and, and you scratch your head sometimes going, but I'm just a, I'm just a plain Jane common citizen. I don't mm -hmm. have, the the legalities that are afforded to people in the military or in law enforcement. Um, and so that's that's something that we we kind of talk to in class as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I think that's a great thing. Let's let's move to that really quick, because um, what if someone were to sign up, say, for your enhanced class, uh -huh. uh, just go, let's let's do the whole gamut like I did. Right. Yep. So I know whenever I took my class from you. Um, it was really, really great because we sat down. It was it was the majority of a day um, that we sat down. Um, there, there's a certain requirement of legal hours that you have to spend uh, to get your concealed carry and your enhanced concealed carry. Um, there different different uh, you know certifications or licensing um, does does require certain amounts of time. It's a long day. So if you're gonna do if you're gonna do your basic and enhanced, we're required to have you in class for seven hours. Okay. And we also have to lot for two hours of range time. Um, you know, we spend uh, the portion of class we spend actually talking about gun stuff is about an hour tops. Yeah. The rest of it is mainly about law, decision making, being aware in public, um, talking about criminal liability, civil liability. We are going to spend time at the range. So uh, at the range, uh, you have to run both a basic qualification, which is instructor defined. Okay. As, as well as an enhanced qualification, which is state defined. Okay. And that enhanced qualification is done under a time stress. And they do that because they want to make sure that you can shoot decently under stress. Now, I might have an opinion to go, well, is that the best target to use? 
uh, because it's very generous, let's say. Yeah. Um, and the times are actually very generous, but most people tend to shoot way faster than mm -hmm. they need to. I've definitely done that. Yeah. Um, She's looking directly at me exactly, when she says that. Exactly. <laughs> um, I look at my classes as a conversation. Yeah. Um, they are, um, and I, you know, for my niche, my, my teaching capability, I choose to do small classes. That's why it'll never be, never be a money making endeavor for me. Um, and first, honestly, for most instructors, it's not even that it's about the passion we have to teach, but it's, we're going to sit around for the majority of a day in the classroom. I feed you. That's yeah. a perk, right? I, I got sloppy joes. There you go. That and was most, the best. Most classes are going to get sloppy joes or pulled <sighs> pork or something like that. So good. And uh, when we go to the range, I work with you individually at the range. So everybody gets, especially if we're doing the enhanced, you're going to get about 30 minutes, uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Kind of just depends on how long to get through the qualification at the range. But that's me and you one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And I think there's benefit to that because in essence, I'm not... It, you're you're walking in there and we take away talking in class about how we should shoot. And I can spend a little bit of time of putting that into play. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's, it's a long day, but I've had a lot of people tell me it goes by very quickly. It does. It really so, does. It, it's a 10 hour day. You know, I'll be frank with you. Most, yeah. most classes don't get done till between six and six 30. Yeah. But it's, it's a long day. I think that's, you know, what you were saying there a while ago. Um, it, a lot of it does tie back into, you know, talking through sit, uh, situations, scenarios. Absolutely. Um, obviously, there's there's a ton you can learn about firearms, right? And this, uh, specifically about your model of firearm, your make, whatever, um, the, the way it shoots or anything. But in reality, I mean, the way I view it, everything uh, dealing with firearms, a gun itself is interchangeable, right? You can, you can learn a, a whole different tool. It's an inert tool, no yeah. different than a vehicle. Yeah. Okay. But I think the best education part, especially that I took away from your class, the best education part was, is, is that learning of what can I do? What can't I do? Um, what is, can, we, we talked about some of the, the reasons behind certain laws and certain rules, certain regulations. Um, because, you know, there are some folks that just think, okay, once you get it, you're good to go. Yeah. And I can stand my ground. Yeah. And what does that mean? You know, exactly. and I think talking the second that someone turns their back on you, well, they're retreating. So you can't. And it depends, you know, actions. but it, but it takes, you got to take in the, the scenario in its entirety. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. but we, we talk a lot about, you know, stress and adrenaline and, and what should we say to police? And, you know, yeah. so it's not just about law. We talk through just real life and, and, you know, we have conversations and we talk about situations that people may have been in mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll break those down and talk through it and say, hey, you know, what, do, what does everybody think? You know, and so we try to bring some personalization into it and, and having that conversation around the table. Yeah, it, it affords us to do that. And, and again, we can talk through some things that people don't really think about is, well, you want to if, if, if a self-defense event occurs, why wouldn't I want to tell the cops if I did everything, if, if I truly believe I did everything right? Yeah. And, you know, we talk about how stress affects our body and our mind and, you know, time shifting. And if we say things we think we saw and we didn't see. And um, so it goes it goes beyond the law. We talk some physiological issues. We talk about just that mindset. We talk about what are you going to do if somebody breaks into your home? Yeah. You know, we, we I literally ask every student, what's your plan? And if you don't have one, that's okay. But, you know, we, we talk through what could that plan maybe be and what is allowed by law. Mm -hmm. But again, what should I do? Or is it a, is it a can I, is it a should I, is it a must I? Yeah. And, and I think that's really good. Like, you know, to, to run through those because a lot of people, maybe they think they have a plan until they realize they don't. Right. Because right. a lot of people would say, well, you know, what, what if somebody broke in your house? Oh, well, I'd stop them. How? Where's it at? What are you using? What's your, what, uh, how much are you training with it? What are, you know, baseball bat? Okay, go for it. Use what's, your baseball What's on bat. the other side of the wall if you're using a gun? Exactly. Yeah. And so you have to start thinking of those things, you know, like I know that, that immediately, that question right there actually changed uh, what I carry because uh, I've got a shotgun available, mm -hmm. right? And so a uh, shotgun, if you use bird shot, one or two layers of drywall, it's done. You know, it stops it, unless you're like super close to it, obviously. But, but, but what's bird shot do to a person? 
uh, well, it, it depends. It, it depends it, on how yeah. close that person is. Exactly. But you've got to understand. probably not what you would want in your home defense shotgun. Yeah, because yes. I've got a wife, I've got a son, I've got dogs. Um, what is behind stuff? Uh, you know, if we've got a, a family member in town, suddenly that guest room is occupied. Absolutely. That wall is now a another potential po- uh, problem, you know. And so uh, it's really good to pay attention to that. Obviously, you have the ability, if you have the ability to get up and get out of your home uh, in the case of an intruder. Awesome. Do it. Get out of there. Get away from them. But if you have to fight, do you know how you're going to fight? And so that's really good to to kind of go through some of that. Let's get into a little bit more, just just some personal fun stuff here with you. Um, I know, uh, one, we've been talking a lot about pistols. Um, what is your favorite pistol, uh, or, or what, what do you currently carry? I'll say that. What's your current uh, choice of firearm for carry? I carry an HK VP9. Okay. Stock as can be with a Hollow Sun 507C optic on it. Um, what drives that? What's, what kind of, what made you choose that one? Um, because the gun fits me well. Okay. It's, uh, it performs how I want it to perform. It has a trigger that I like the feel of the trigger. Yeah. Um, most people that that's a second thought for them, but I, I am very much, a, I'm a trigger snob. I really want a, a short crisp trigger. I don't want a lot of travel. Um, and, and could I make my trigger better? better? Yes. I could ca- go have trigger jobs done, but yeah. I, I want, I, I personally just want to shoot a stock gun and I feel like honestly, it's the, the best out of the box that you can get. Yeah. Um, very configurable gun, uh, you know, with the side, str- side panels, back panel makes it very configurable. I carried, you know, prior to that, I carried the, the kind of the smaller brother to that, which is the VP nine SK, okay. which has you, you, you give up about a half an inch on the barrel and the grip, but you could carry a, a magazine with a longer grip, which I did. Mm-hmm. So I could have more, more ammo. But I found out going to class, uh, using that gun that, that at distance, I could not be quite as accurate with it. Okay. So that barrel, that barrel length makes a difference. So that's why I carry such a large gun because I feel like I want the ability to make that 15 yard shot because I am capable of that 15 yard shot. Everybody needs to know what their capable, yeah. uh, reliable distance is. And I knew I could be that if I had that barrel, but that, yeah. that gun just fits me well. We, we, you have to understand that you cannot just go tell, tell your friend, Oh, go buy a Glock 17. Exactly. It, it, buying a gun is a very personal experience. It's a, an experience that that gun has to fit you well. It has to fit your hands. Well, you have to be able to reach the trigger properly um, you have you want to be able to he- reach the magazine release. So there's there's things you look at with that. Yeah. And for me, that gun has just worked well. And I, I can I can pick up and shoot most guns fairly well, but that is still my favorite gun to shoot. I know it, I know it inside and out. I know what it feels like. I know when that trigger is gonna break. So it's 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 just my gun. Yeah. So it is my favorite gun. I love HK. I, yeah. I think they're a great company. And so, yeah, I, I should own stock in them because I own four of those things. You know so. what? It's if, if it works, it works. That's, it does. That's, and Absolutely. You've let me shoot your uh, VP9. There, uh-huh. And I really, really enjoyed the feel of that. And so now we're kind of on a mission. Uh, if anybody's uh, listening right now and you've got one you'd like to let go of, then uh, let me know. Uh, but we're looking for a VP9 because I do like that grip, right? You mentioned uh, the, the interchangeable panels and the grip and everything, mm-hmm. too. Um, that was one thing I noticed just to go back to your other point there. It's, it's not just about price, right? Because you can go out and you can buy a cheap gun. You can buy an affordable gun, but you will get what you pay for. Exactly. And if, if that's what you can afford, then do it and do it and, and care for that product Yeah. and, and run it and make sure you know how it runs or find the best ammo for it. That's it. Because a gun is better than no gun. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I would challenge you to find the best gun for you yeah. um, and, and, and get to that, that position yeah. is, is to get the gun that, that fits you best, that you can shoot best. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of disparity in price of guns yeah. and, and there's a reason for that. And so do your research. Yeah. Um, you know, go watch reputable people on YouTube, go read articles you know, before you yeah. make that decision, but you know, I, I do, I've, I, there are some people that that's all they can afford, Yeah. but they have to get that gun working into a position to where it's not going to jam when they need it. 
And I'll tell you this right now. Don't use steel ammo. Do not use steel ammo. Please don't use steel ammo. For your own sake, please don't. It, it, if you want to work on malfunctions, yeah, that's steel ammo is great. That is a great way yes. to do your drills. And, and there's you're... there are some ranges that don't allow you to just yeah. be for insurance liability. So yeah. uh, I know it's cheaper, um, but I I I feel like it's easier on the gun to run brass as well. The yeah. guns were made to run brass. Yeah. So yeah, it, it expands differently, contracts it differently, it, it it transfers heat differently, everything. So. Uh, that, that is one thing we can, we could go, we could probably talk for an hour just on ammunition. So we're not going to right now. Um, but what, uh, so let's go to the opposite end of that. What is, what would you say is the worst gun you've ever shot? Do you remember what, what was something that's just undesirable to you, whether, whether it was a performance of the firearm or you're just like, dude, this just doesn't work for me. Uh, a gun that is not properly lubricated. Okay. Any gun that's, yeah, that's true. That's okay. True. Yeah. You, you can have the best gun and if it's not properly lubricated, yeah, it's a brick. Yeah. So then you're uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying a gun has to be spotless yeah. <laughs> because people will tell you, I, I hate gun cleaning. I yep. do. Oh, I'm yeah. just going to admit that to the world right now. <sighs> it's the worst part of gun ownership. Um, but you find the balance of when, you know, how clean do you want it to have? My, my carry gun is spotless. Yeah. All the rest of my guns, they are properly lubricated. So I will guarantee they're going to work well. Yeah. And when they stop not working well, because even when they're properly lubricated, they can stop working well. Yeah. Then it's time to clean them. You know, I don't stress over the cleaning part for my guns that are not meant for my self protection. Yeah. But if it is your self-protection, you have to decide what it means to you for you to have that gun clean and well well lubricated or lubricated to a point that it works well. Some guns like more lube than others. Yeah. So it's you have to understand that. So so the worst gun to shoot is one that just plain does not work because yeah. either it's it's way too dirty or most likely it's a it's it's not properly lubricated. It's you got to have the right kind of lubrication because there are quite a few companies out there that make different products. I'm not going to name any of them because that that's on them. But um, just just do your research because you don't want to use just any lubrication. I've seen some folks, you know, talk about, oh, WD-40 this or something else like that. Right. And it's like there are products that are specifically made for firearm maintenance. They're calibrated. They are tested to firearms and the use of firearms yeah the so. heat the friction everything exactly. else um so you want to be you only want to use really good product there so now um i know we've got we've got just a little bit of time left here when i was in class uh you had mentioned that there was a situation and uh i hope, hope you're okay with me asking about this one because okay. um i know it's very personal for you but you had mentioned there was an accident that you had had that kind of through your through your firearms training and your, your handling really um, for a loop, right? Like it, it kind of so, changed everything. What happened? Tell us about this. Like I heard I, there was I, a train and a scooter and something yes, going on. What in the yes, world? Yes. So um, we were in Prague. So in the Czech Republic okay. uh, on vacation, we had just finished a 10 day trip in Israel in the, in, you know, seeing all the, the just amazing places in Israel. And we, my husband happened to have a work trip in Prague. So we okay. hopped from Israel to Prague and we had a couple of days to sightsee. So on day one, we decided to take the scooter tour and it was my husband and me and the tour guide. I was in the, the last of the little train and we spent all morning on the scooters. And then we went up and we did the segways, you know, and everybody was all freaking out. Oh, segway, you know. Oh, yeah, because they were relatively new to the the, the mass public. At yeah, that point, right? you know, like, th- this was five years ago. Yeah, so. they were gaining popularity. And uh, so, yeah, we head back into town on the scooters. And unbeknownst to us, uh, later I was told this was one of the busiest streets in Prague. Oh. And Prague has uh, commuter trains that run on the streets. So okay. if you've ever gone to San Francisco or Seattle, you know, or can- there's some in Kansas City even where they, mm-hmm. they run on the street. So like they have to, cars have to be careful of them while on the street. Uh, so we had the scooter or the the train, commuter train, and park cars to the right. Well, a train come up from behind. And again, I was last in the train of scooters. Mm-hmm. And the train didn't hit me. I hit the train. So, so you're not supposed to do that. No, I know it. I I sideswiped the train. I think what happened is I think there's that column of air that pushes, you know, from the front of the train. If you ever sat in a subway, you feel that column of air. 
And, and I, I knew the train was coming, but I guess I didn't account for that because it pushed me over and I didn't want to hit the parked cars Mm -hmm. and I overcorrected into the side of the train. Mm. So let's say a motorized scooter with a bicycle seat does not do well um, when it decides to go the speed of the train and you're going the speed of the scooter. I would imagine yeah, so. So, so if we want a dynamic critical incident. So I, I was thrown into a, a adrenaline dump basically at that point. Um, but that, that accident, you know, caused a lot of damage to me. But one of the things it did is it, it bruised my nerves in my neck so that my index fingers didn't work properly. Hmm. So I literally could not bend the first joint of my index finger, which is kind of important um, when shooting a firearm. I feel like that would put an immediate stop yeah, to a lot it, of people's it, it situation. Kind of stop that situation. So, um, you know, that was probably the least of, of the severity of the accident and in, in my injury. So I, I, you know, I was laid up for over three months. Wow. basically kind of bedridden. Um, I didn't walk for three weeks. I had to have a private medical transport from Prague back to our local airport. Yeah. Cause you were still overseas. I was still overseas. So, so I shameless plug, get travel insurance if you're going to leave the country. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, but laying in bed and I, I loved shooting guns so much and I'm, I'm a big dry fire nut, mm-hmm. huge dry fire nut, dry fire quite a bit. And so I just decided I was going to figure out my way through this problem. And so I, um, you know, started picking up a, a cert pistol, which is a training pistol that shoots a laser Yeah. and just realized I couldn't press the trigger. I literally had not, I didn't have enough flexion in my finger yeah. to actually press the trigger. And so I started doing some research online, watching YouTube videos. And there are some people out there that purposely shoot with their middle finger. And huh. so I'm like, okay. So That's I just possible. started laying in bed with my little cert gun, learning how to hold the gun and press the trigger, not just on my right hand, but my left hand, because I couldn't do my left hand either mm. with my middle finger, which yep. means when I was drawing the gun, I would actually draw the gun with two fingers in my thumb Okay, um, because I had to use this finger to get on the trigger. So, um, and, and it taught me a lot that, that not with people with, uh, disabilities mm-hmm. that we can find ways around everything. Yeah. Um, and, and so we just need to be creative in the gun world that, that I don't care how disabled a person is. We, we will work with them yeah. and work what, what they are able to do and make it work. So it also opened my eyes up to how our bodies react under that adrenaline response. Oh yeah. Um, because if, if you'd asked me or told me, before my accident, okay, you're going to have this severe accident. How are you going to react? And I would probably told you, I would be screaming. I'd be crying, um, you know, be a little chaotic. And I remember I was just the calmest thing at that point. I felt, I felt nothing but calm. Now, part of that was laying on the street. I felt no pain because I had enough adrenaline screaming through my body. Yeah. Um, the, the first point that I actually felt pain was when they laid me in the ambulance. Cause that's your first measure of, I feel safe. I feel like, you know, I'm going to get help. Yeah. You've let your guard down. You've let your point. guard down a little bit, but it was really interesting. It was fascinating that when I got home here and they wheeled me up to the hospital room at mercy here and laid me in that bed, I actually went into shock. Okay. That's the moment when, the, I, I literally started shaking uncontrollably. I mean, I, I emotionally, I lost it. Yeah. Um, it was the weirdest thing. And it's because I had had my guard up even because you're in a, in government run healthcare, yeah. um, in another country, which is very vastly different than healthcare here in the U S I know there's a lot of problems with healthcare here in the U S yeah. but let me tell you it, you, we got it pretty good. We got it pretty good. We got it way good. Yeah. Um, so, so the fact is, is I learned that, but also, you know, playing through that incident, I've done some medical training. So those 700 hours is not just gun training. If you're going to carry a gun, you probably should carry a tourniquet and know how to use it. Ooh, okay. um, because medically, you know, that is tourniquets. If, if people would just have more tourniquets with them, every police officer has a tourniquet. It's for themselves because that is the most effective way for us to to not bleed out a spe- from a limb. Yeah. Now, a tourniquet's not going to help your neck. It's not, yeah. It wasn't going to help the cut I got on my head. Yeah. But the first thing I thought when I hit the ground and I saw all the blood was 
I knew I had two tourniquets in my backpack. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I've got those two tourniquets. And I knew you nick your head a bleed of tons. And I'm yeah. like, I got my wits about me. So my brains must not be hanging out. But there was still a lot of blood. And I had I had a pretty good gash on my leg. Yeah. Um, and so I thought about my tourniquets. But then the, the, the ambulance, I started hearing the ambulance showed up really quickly. And, and you know, so it's, I sat in the hospital. I was recapping this with my husband. I was like, gosh, I wish I had a video of, you know, just that whole incident. And so I started talking through kind of what went through my brain. And when I started talking about the tourniquets that I was thinking about them, he looks at me and he said, you asked for those tourniquets. I says, no, I didn't. He said, oh, yes, you did. And I'm like, to this day, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I never, ever, ever said the word tourniquet out of my mouth. And he said, I said, the ambulance, I was impressed, you know, within like two minutes, I, I heard the sirens, they were coming. He's like, they were like eight minutes. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, Okay. So adrenaline will screw with you Your and brain that, fills you know, in adrenaline and that cortisol dump. So that's why I bring that story up in class. Sometimes when people go, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to know what to say. Yeah. Mm, it, what you think, you know, you're going to say and what actually happened might be two separate things. So, you know, until you truly experience it at that grave of a level, mm-hmm. I don't think you really understand how much it changes what goes on in your brain. And again, I, I'd still to this day, if you just said, hey, I'm, we're going to lay you in that hospital in in Rogers here after you get off the airplane and, and you're going to go into shock. I would that's have said, really, losing. that doesn't make any sense. But yeah. that's exactly what happened. And that that's because I then I fully I, I probably let my guard down 100 percent at that point. Yeah, because I knew I was going to get the treatment I needed here. Mm-hmm. So. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a very odd story. Um, it it, it showed a lot in me, um, the, of fortitude. You know, you don't know your own fortitude until you have to go through something like that. Uh, it sucked. It sucked for me laying in bed. It truly sucked. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love being out with people. I love teaching. I loved being, you know, with friends, and I was missing so much. So it kind of, you know, it. I says, okay, I got to get my button gear and. My my PT was I would have my husband throw laundry in, and when it got dry, I would walk to the kitchen and yeah. fold two or three pieces of laundry and walk right back to bed because yeah. that's all I could do. But you do more and more and more of that. Um, gosh, there's a lot of God in that story too. Yeah. Um, we, you know, I had just been in Israel for ten days. Yeah with with my church with a large group from our church it was a yeah. hundred it was like this massive trip they didn't expect it to be this big but it ended up being like 150 people went and i made some friendships on that that um one of them was a, a medical relationship that 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 doctor worked at mercy and had admitting privileges to get me home because they would wow. not fly me home unless somebody signed that they were going to accept me um, that, that relationship developed in Israel, not because we knew we needed it, but we just had dinner a few times. And yeah. he said, when, when they heard I had an accident, he said, here's my cell phone. You know, um, our church had a missionary in Prague. Wow. Now, now, yeah, the odds and, of that are... and that missionary was a nurse here in the States. Okay. Okay. So she didn't know medical terminology in, in the Czech language, but she could at least communicate and, you know, it's, it, it, it was amazing. She would come to the hospital for eight hours and, and do as much mm. translation. And she brought everything to us because honestly, you don't even get a gown when you go to the hospital in Prague. Wow. Like you are expected to bring everything with you. All right, then. So, yeah. Um, Mental note. Do yeah. not go to a hospital in Prague. Um, yeah, let, that, let's say I wore a sheet. Yeah. Well, and, and honestly, with my injuries, it was really oh, yeah. cumbersome oh, yeah. for me to have anything on. But yeah. um, the fact is, 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 you know, that was just a God thing. Yeah. You know, having the, the relationship with the doctor in Israel, God thing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, people here, I, I, you know, people coming out of the woodwork to help and, um, you know, a, a, a friend, you know, I had a friend who really was that person who she allowed me to complain to her yeah. that I was like, why did God do this to me? And, and she was there for me to speak truth yeah. and to make sure I was okay. And, and so, you know, 
things like that are special and that can't be formed just, you know, organically. It's, it's, and they are formed organically through things like that. So, exactly. Yeah. So when you're at your worst, that's where you truly find out who, who's, who's got your back. And, and, yeah. and so it was a very trying time in my life, but I learned so much and, and people are saying, well, that's crazy that you would do it all over again, but I would absolutely 100% would go through it all again to learn what I've learned. Mm. And, and my relationship with God has changed so much through that as well. Yeah. So um, not saying go out and get on a scooter and try and hit a train to, to make, you know, that better, but yeah, but take those bumps in your life yeah. and try and put a pot of positive spin on them. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. But no, I was, I was so excited and, and uh, you know, to get back to teaching after that, but uh, to go to my first national level class yeah. as a student was six months after the accident. Oh, wow. And in, in working and shooting middle finger. So, yeah, you, I think you had touched on that just a little bit in the class as well. And you said you'd, you'd gone back and, the, and the, what, what was it that the instructor the told instructor you? The instructor walked up. He's like, why are you shooting like that? And all I had to say, you know, and he was very respectful. And he says, yeah. you know, it says I had an accident. He's like, OK. Yeah. And but at lunch, he wanted to hear why. Yeah. You know, what what caused that, you know, so. Um, like, well, yeah, there's a story. There's Sit a down. story. It's a big story. Gather around. But yes. So, <laughs> um, but that challenge, and again, after a year, uh, and and the neurologist told me, I mean, I I had some funky nerve damage. I mean, my shoulder blade was was sticking out like a, an extra inch. Wow. Because my muscles didn't know to pull it in, and so he was like, "This is all related." He says, "It's all going to go away. Yeah, you are you're going to get most of your stuff back." And he says, "He may not be a hundred percent, and it's not." I will still to this day tend to work with my middle finger over my index finger. Okay. But I shoot gun with index fingers now. Okay. So it took about a year to work itself out. And so, you know, just keep at it. All yeah. I can tell people is if you're struggling with something, keep at it, be tenacious. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it may not be perfect, but when it comes to being your own self protector, do the best you can. Yeah. Do the best you can. Mm. That's really good. And I know, you know, just from my own personal experience, I know that a lot of that, um, that exact approach um, goes into all of your teaching. And so thank you so much for uh, one, sharing your story with us here. But two, uh, thanks for working with me, because I know you've, you've already made a huge difference in my training, my abilities, my skills. Um, and, and you're really, really good at picking up on what I'm doing. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even say wrong. I'm just doing it in a way that's not the best for my performance. Exactly. Right. And so it's like, the I most can get efficient. better. Exactly. exactly. And so if I can improve and you're able to point that out just by watching me shoot, um, you know, I've already improved my draw. I've already improved, you know, my accuracy and things like that. And I got to say, uh, you were the first person to tell me about the Mantis system. Um, and I, I, that has been a godsend for me because it's been able to help me that little, y'all, the, this is the X 10 and this, I mean, you, you turned me on to this one and it has changed the way that I shoot. Absolutely changed it. And so I think finding a good firearms instructor like Kara here um, is, is absolutely crucial. If you're wanting to improve your skills, if you're wanting to improve your abilities, um, find someone. And, and especially if you're in Northwest Arkansas area, um, how can people sign up for a class with you, learn more about your classes? What's the best way? They can go to spiritfirearmstraining.com. Okay. Uh, there's a contact form. Um, I believe my, I'm pretty sure my phone number is out there. You okay. can get me on email through there, but yeah, that's probably the best way or on Facebook, Spirit Firearms Training on Facebook. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of more Northern in yeah. Northwest Arkansas. And if you are in Fayetteville or whatever, and you go, Hey, that's just a long distance. I can give you some recommendations to some other great instructors yeah. uh, in the area. Uh, you know, we are truly blessed in this area to have I, I, we are kind of a little cadre that hang out together and train together. And so I wouldn't recommend uh, people to an instructor unless I've vetted that instructor myself. And, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, you put what's the value to getting instruction, even mm. if it's just one private lesson that could, that changes a lot. Even when you go back to the range yourself, yeah. uh, you kind of know what to work on. So the, the best thing I think anybody could do is, is before they ever buy a gun, before you even go to the store to look at a gun, 
go go get a, a class, go do an intro class with somebody mm-hmm. because you're going to learn what you need in a gun before you go spend four, five, six, seven hundred dollars on something that you might find out later is not for you. Yeah. So absolutely. No, and and I think that's that is crucial because you know, even now on my own journey with firearms. Um, I've got my Ruger Security Nine. Love the fi- lo- love that pistol, right? Like it's a really great performing pistol. Um, I'm I'm also learning more about grips and the the, the specific shapes of the handles and everything else. So, is that going to be my long term carry? I don't know. It might not be. Um, we're looking at that VP Nine, right? We're looking for that. I mentioned that earlier in this in this show, um, because it, it there is so much that goes into it. But you're you're right. Yep. Triggers, triggers, trigger reach. I mean, there's so many different variables in it. Yeah. And it might seem very minuscule, but that minuscule change may make a large change in, in how you shoot. Yeah. Optics are another thing. You know, some people, um, you know, looking at going to optics, optics, you know, they, mm-hmm. they, there's some big benefits there. Um, but there's nothing wrong with iron sights. Yeah. I mean, you're rocking it with the iron I'm trying. sights. I'm trying. You're, you're doing really good. And so, um, you know, don't, don't put the cart before the horse, yeah. um, really go get some instruction and find out what works for you. Most, most instructors who are passionate about their students will bring guns for the, you to use. Yep. They are going to have them. They're going to have a good selection of quality firearms for, for you to try as a student. Yeah. And that's the best place you can start. That's going to be the best value up front. And then once you do that, Go rent guns before yep. you buy the gun. Yeah, I know. Rent we've got a, and shoot it before you buy the gun. We've got a couple ranges around here specifically that will that allow will you rent to guns. rent those out Absolutely. and test drive them essentially. Yes. And so definitely please do that. It, spend the hundred bucks or yeah. 80 bucks or 50 bucks to go rent, buy the ammo, shoot the gun before you go buy the gun. So worth it. So worth it. That would have saved me a lot. Um, I, I won't say the name of the gun that I, that I, my first handgun that I purchased. It, it was a good pistol. It was fun. It was what I could afford, right? Exactly. Going back to it, it's what I could afford. And I learned to train with that gun to the point where I could be relatively accurate, right? Mm-hmm. Like I could be pretty decent with it. But the more I learned and the more I have grown, the, uh, man, you, you got to find the right one. You got to find that right grip because, you know, as as we were even talking earlier, uh, there's some some stuff that you know, I've been working on my car. I've been working with my uh, my pistol training and everything else. And after a while, your hands... If you don't have the right grip uh, for that, then it's definitely going to uh, affect your shooting. Yes. So. <laughs> and, and a good instructor will also help you if you say, hey, here's my budget. Yeah. They're going to guide you and say, you know, here's a good mid-range gun or or low-range gun that yep. that it has the reliability behind it. You know, I think, you know, you you, you have that Ruger Security 9. I do yeah. think that's a for for the money. Yeah. That is a a great option out there. Right now, it's in the mid threes. Yeah, I think, so as I of think the time I think that this. is that is you know, and they make a security three eighty as well. Yep. That honestly is is a great uh, gun intro- introductory gun to some students who who might struggle with recoil of a nine mm-hmm. um, or racking the slide. So so the manufacturers starting to get smarter. Yeah. Um. You know, I think we saw that initially with Smith and Wesson in their EZ series. We've seen it with Walther. Um, we're, we're now seeing that with Ruger. I sure hope that all the manufacturers are taking stock in that and realizing that, um, you know, gun ownership is not the, the typical white male yeah. uh, owners anymore. And they're, they're of all colors. They're, they're male, they're female, all ages. they're young, they're old. Yep. Absolutely. So there's all ages. So there's just so much out there. There's yeah. so much out there. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for being here. I will make sure and put a link to your website down in the show notes of this podcast. Um, there's also, again, mentioning uh, there's a, a link to the USCCA down there. So if you uh, need insurance, I'm going to encourage every single person, if you carry, make sure you have insurance on yourself there. Because, you know, if you ever have to use it, the legal system can tie you up real fast. I mean, sometimes, right, uh, if you've used a firearm, even if it's justified, they might take that firearm for a certain mm-hmm. amount of time. Um, you might be out that. You might have different processing costs depending on you're the. Still going to need a in. lawyer. Yeah, you're going to need an attorney to do something. So, just get the membership, guys. Twenty nine bucks a month. You can't beat that. Um, up to two million in coverage. And like, 
uh, I was actually starting to go through some of their training the other day, uh, their video training on there as well. I know I've got ASP now. I've got uh, concealed carry or the uh, USCCA, and I'm just learning a lot right now. So yeah, guys, get out there, get you a membership. That's in the show to- show notes of this as well. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time here on the Brew House. Thanks again for joining us. Cheers. You've been listening to the Brew House, a production of Remnant Media. Be sure to subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your other favorite podcasting platform so you don't miss another great episode. Talk.